I, uh, <clears throat> today I'm um, empowered by the Holy Spirit and espresso. So it's still early in California time, but it's so good to be here. And I, uh, what an honor it is to speak in such an incredible church. And first of all, I want to thank um, the pastors, Mark and Patricia, for everything they do to get behind the Let Us Worship movement, and they were some of the crazies that we found along the journey in 2020. People that weren't willing to back down and stay open and fight for the church. And, you know, I, I share, I've been sharing this quite a bit, and I mean, I'm just going to warn you, uh, this message this morning is going to have a little teeth to it. Um, you, you really fight for the things you love. I grew up in church. My parents are full-time medical missionaries. Then they were missions pastors. I've seen it all. And, you know, when the government came against the church, it was really time for us to fight. 2020 was a, was a test, you know? And, you know, some people say, well, is it the Antichrist? Is it Revelation? Is it end times? It's, it really, I believe, was a dress rehearsal for things that are to come. And... You know, I feel like it really um, revealed a lot. It exposed a lot. It's still exposing a lot. And, you know, in the body of Christ, we want God to expose everything that needs to be exposed. We cry out. The Israelites cried out for the judgment of God because they knew the judgment of God was the mercy of God. In America, we're crying out for God to bring his, expose everything that needs to be exposed. And in 2020, in the year when kings went off to war, David was on his roof. And there was a lot of leaders in the body of Christ that should have been fighting that were on their roof. But you got some pastors that are fighters. So I really want to honor them. I'm thankful for them. We're really, 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 they're, they're, they've just been such a blessing. Your worship team is amazing. I mean, I, uh, I, I felt like I was in the Holy Ghost sauna this morning. <laughs> and I needed that. I really did need that. I want to give a little bit of prophetic context. Um, I think that's going to set us up for tonight, but also set us up for this season that we're living in right now. Can I get a little bit of uh, my vocal in the monitor up here? It'd be awesome. First, I want to introduce my family. Um, if you can throw them, that's, that's my family. Um, we were on a hike a couple days ago before I got on a plane, and um, I love them. I have four kids. That's my wife, Kate. We were high school sweethearts. We've been, uh, you know, we've been together since we were 16 years old uh, in high school. That's my kids. That's Katura. Right there, my daughter Malachi with the blue hat, Ezra with the green shirt, and little Zion the lion uh, at the bottom. And uh, I was in Myrtle Beach last night. We had an event, um, and of course I went and I had to get the, uh, you know, the airbrush shirts, you know. So I, I went, I know they're so cheesy, but my kids are going to love them, you know. So I was picking out logos for all the kids to have on their airbrush shirts, and for Zion, I said, you're going to have to make a lion, and the guy's like, well, what about Simba? And I'm like, no, no, Zion's crazy. He has, th he has two brothers. He's wild. Like, we need a lion. So anyway, I, I love my family, and uh, I oftentimes get to travel with them, but this trip is a little crazy. Um, I, I feel uh, today's a prophetic moment. Uh, I feel like not just in America, in, in my own uh, personal history, um, and I feel like uh, I want to bring you, I want to catch some of you guys up in what I feel like the Lord's doing after going to 160 cities across America. I don't know that there's more ministries or people that have seen the things that we have seen. You know, I mean, think of a hard and dark, hopeless city. We've been there. Think of a place that's been in the middle of a riot or destruction. We've worshiped there. You know, think of, uh, think of what you saw on the TV, uh, you know, on, on cable news and on, on, online on your Twitter feeds over the last couple of years. The Lord has sent us in with worship into the every single corner of America. I mean, we've done cornfields in Pennsylvania and we've done downtown Portland, Oregon in the middle of a hundred day riot. 
We've brought worship everywhere. And I feel like the Lord has given us a perspective, and this is a big part of what we want to release tonight. Now, when we were initially planning, uh, we knew that we had this thing in Myrtle Beach, and, I, and, and, and Jay and I were, were praying. We're like, man, we got the whole band there. We got everybody around. We, we should really do something crazy. Like, where is a crazy church with a bunch of wild people that we could gather and do a prophetic night? And, you know, the first, you know, 222 night that we did was in Pasadena, California on a Tuesday of February 22nd, 22222. And for me, it was significant because I've carried this word of Isaiah 22, 22, which, uh, which talks about, I will lay on him the key of David. You know, the, what he opens, no man can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. It's a prophetic verse about Jesus being the one that can open the door, and also about worship, which if you remember in Matthew 16, Jesus then gave us the keys, Right? To not just be a Christian club and do nice Southern church, but to open things and shut things in the spirit. How many of you know things need to be open and shut over America today? Okay, so let me catch you up on this and then, and then we're gonna jump into the word. So we planned this thing. We're so excited. We've been writing songs. We're, 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 we were pumped. Little did we know that today, tonight would literally kick off two of our biggest, most intense events that we have in America this year. The first one being Monday night in Orlando in front of Disney World. When this whole thing broke out, um, when this whole thing broke out of, of Disney and the exposing of the sexualization of our kids, by the way, y'all should get this in the back. Defund Disney, hold the line. <laughs> Um, when this whole thing broke out, like I, you know, I, I just, I don't know about you, but I was like, no, 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 I'm not okay with this. An organization specifically saying on record, they're targeting to groom our children. I hope all y'all are not okay with this. And, and so, and so we staged, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a protest, the first one in Burbank at the headquarters of Disney, and we had, I don't know, we had hundreds of people there. It was wild. Then the next week, we did one in Disneyland, and then now we're going to do the biggest one of them all in Disney World. We've been in touch with the governor of Florida. I mean, people are hype. It's gonna be, there's going to be a lot, a lot of people there, and it, and, it, and, it, and it represents to me the battle for the purity of our children in this day and age. Are we gonna sit back and let these woke corporations do the things that they do? Or are they gonna see a church rise with boldness? That's the first thing on Monday. The second thing on Tuesday, which is even bigger, is we're gathering in front of the Supreme Court. Now, come on, some of y'all. Listen, listen, your church is sending us to Orlando and to D.C., And in front of the Supreme Court, this is reverse the curse. We are living in a day where we are going to witness the death decree over America reversed. Roe v. Wade is going to the pit of hell. Roe v. Wade's going to the pit of hell. And so when this, when this Supreme Court draft was leaked, which was intentional, which was on purpose, which was to create havoc, which was, uh, you know, supposed to cause rioting, all the things that they're doing. I mean, these people are crazy. They're going to the homes of the Supreme Court justices. They're threatening violence. I mean, these, I don't know if you are seeing what's happening. It's the full-on exposing of the demonic spirit of abortion. We're witnessing it, Okay. So on Tuesday, we're going to be in front of the Supreme Court. And, and, you know, I don't know, when this draft opinion was leaked, I was like, we got to worship, man. The enemy is trying to kill this thing. We need worshipers to rise up. I said, who's doing something? I was calling congressmen and senators. Who's doing something? Well, I don't know. Who's doing something? I said, all right, we're doing something. They said, okay. 
So now on Tuesday, this is going to be the largest prayer and worship gathering of the year in front of the Supreme Court. And I wanted to share that context because I want to talk about this morning about how worship is our weapon. Turn to someone and say, worship is our weapon. We are being sent from this night of prophetic worship to Orlando and to Washington, D.C. I believe this represents two of the most, the, the biggest issues that we need breakthrough in in our generation. And they're happening back to back as we leave here. I don't think that's a coincidence. Anybody else? So I came this morning to preach about worship being our weapon. I want you to turn in your Bible to Psalm 149. Y'all awake this morning? <laughs> I'm telling you, tonight's gonna be crazy. Tonight is gonna be wild. We got a bunch of crazy Californians coming in here. And we're gonna set this place on fire in the spirit, of course. 149 verse six, it says this, may the praise of God be in their mouths as a double-edged sword in their hands. Worship is our weapon. Turn to someone and say it again. Worship is our weapon. Now, there is a, a myth that I wanna break that's very common in the South. I grew up in Virginia, I, in Virginia Beach. I grew up, I, I understand the dynamics. Worship, three fast, three slow, prepares our heart for the preaching, gets us ready for the word. It's kind of the warm up thing that we do in church. Can I just humbly submit to you that that is wrong? That that is bad theology. Worship is the main event. <laughs> this is why we gather. This is the reason we come together. And in fact, in 2020, I was so shocked because it was, there was a direct assault on the worshiping church. Some of y'all are with me. Now, y'all didn't experience the levels that we did in California or other places across America. But when in the history of our nation has government ever told the church that they can't do what the church is called to do? It's never happened before. In 250 years of American history, this has never happened. And so all of a sudden we have a moment, and, and by the way, I was really tuned in a little bit more than probably other people because I had just finished a congressional run and I did not want to run for Congress, especially not in California, which I don't recommend if you're conservative, but I did it. I was being obedient to the Lord and I felt like it was because he wanted me to peek behind the veil to see who these people really are, to see the hidden agendas, to understand the dynamics. So then when the pandemic hit and strip clubs were open, marijuana dispensaries were open, bars were open, Costco was open, but the church was a problem. <laughs> the church is a super spreader. And I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't as frustrated that the politicians did what they did. I was frustrated that the church was complying. And this goes to show you how much of an industry worship has become. We've made worship an industry. It's become so dumbed down. It's become just a K-Love thing where we just, we play the CCM hits. We do the K-Love thing. We do the couple songs. It's kind of nice. And, and when, the, it, when we made worship an industry and the industry shut down, we shut our worship down with the industry. The major mainline churches were not just shutting down, they were shaming people that wouldn't shut down. I mean, I was coming off a record label. I was coming off a record deal. I, I was in that industry. I was riding with the top songwriters in Nashville and places all over the world. When I stood up and I said, we are not gonna stop worshiping, people disowned me. I mean, we were writing songs about not being a slave to fear and now people are afraid to go to church. I mean, it's mind boggling. 
And, and, and in the very hour in America where suicide, depression, hopelessness, chaos, confusion, rioting, you know, you got the racial tension, all this stuff was happening. That's the moment we needed worship. And the church was closed. <laughs> because worship became an industry and the industry told us to shut down. And so that's what we did. And because of it, we had almost two years of chaos and confusion and hopelessness and suicide and depression and we're still not yet recovered. I mean, churches all over America are empty and I do believe that the post-COVID church looks different. I do believe that we're a little more gnarly. I do believe that we're a little bit more fighters. I do believe that we're finding our voice and finding our call again, but it all begins in the place of worship. It all begins in the place of praise. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, 10, 4, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So the enemy is so clever that he came to steal the song and steal the sound and use people to try to shame the church and telling us, well, hey, listen, if you really love the Lord, if you really love your neighbor, you're gonna sit at home with the mask on watching a live stream. <laughs> no, this is for real. People actually said this, like leaders in the body of Christ, respectable leaders, right? And, you know, I love online church and let's wave to everybody online. Let's wave to everybody. We love online church. It's amazing. But I want to be very clear. Online church is not a substitute. It's not a substitute for this. Hebrews is very, the book of Hebrews is very clear. It says, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. A friend of mine, you know, says it like this, that, that online church is like a fire that you can see, but you can't feel the warmth. And we're in a season right now in America where people are, are, have been so disconnected because it takes like eight or 10 weeks, I believe, to set a new pattern in your life. That's what psychologists say. And so now people have set a pattern where they don't even go to church, they just kind of watch it. And they're disconnected from community. They're disconnected from the laying on of hands. They're disconnected from me being on the front row prophesying over some of you. They're disconnected from the body and they feel like that they're getting nourishment and it's just not true. And so I wanna encourage you guys, obviously I'm grateful, you know, that we can have technology. I think it's a beautiful thing, but I wanna be very clear. It's not a substitute for this. And if that means you're in a nation or a city where you don't have a life-giving church, then watch it and get with some people in a room and worship together and lay hands on each other and prophesy over each other and look in each other's eyes to make sure that you're alive and you're thriving and you're full of God. This is the season for us to come together, amen? And don't miss it tonight because it's gonna be wild. We have to regain the power of breakthrough in worship. You know, I love the, the, the I, I wanna talk a little bit. There's three stories I wanna talk about, but the first one um, is actually from an, a book that I'm releasing uh, that's, that's coming out. It's called um, Bold. And of course, it's a book about boldness. Yeah, you can pre-order it. That would be awesome if you pre-order it. It's been canceled twice. <laughs> Two of the biggest publishers in America have canceled it, which means that it's probably a message we need to hear. <laughs> it's so funny too, because it's like, I don't even know why they canceled it. Like it's totally not political. It's all just scripture. And they're like, oh, it's too controversial. Can't have, can't have boldness right now, you know? Um, but in the book, I share a story and I was 16 years old and I was going on my first trip to India. And, um, and, and I, I just was so excited. And by the way, wh when I became a worship leader, it was actually kind of by accident. I didn't have any desire to, you know, write songs or do albums or travel or I'd be an itinerant minister or be on a record label. I just love worship so much in youth group. I thought if I can get a guitar and play a couple chords, I can experience this in my bedroom. That was my heart, right? And probably... 
they prematurely put me, because our, our youth group leader had to go on to college, and so they prematurely put me uh, as the worship leader, and I probably should have stayed in my bedroom for a while because it was horrible. <laughs> and I knew like two or three chords. It's funny now, I, I meet my heroes that I listen to growing up as a worship leader, and I, I always tell them the story that I took all their songs and I reduced them down to two chords. I would just print the chord chart out and i say, ah, I know that one, don't know that one, cross it out. Know that one, don't know that one, you know. But when I went to India for the first time, um, I, you know, and I've, I've been now almost 25 times. It's a place that's very dear to our heart. We've rescued over a thousand children today in India from um, temple prostitution and the sex trade. It's a, a place that we're very engaged in. But the first time I went there, um, the, uh, I, I had just learned how to play guitar. I was just learning about worship and I was visiting the villages of Northern India where there was a crazy revival happening among the Sikh peoples. And if you don't know what the Sikh peoples are, they're like, you, you'll probably meet one if you get a taxi ride in, in New York City. Like they have turbans on, they're, they're really sweet people, but their, their religion is super dark. It's super gnarly. And uh, Amritsar is the kind of where this where the, the temple is, and yet there was a revival happening in North India where they were getting saved, and it was God was showing up through visions and dreams, and it was a powerful movement. And so we were going to these house churches, and so I show up in India, and this pastor picks me up, and he says, uh, "We're going to go. We have five church services today." And I, you know, bring your guitar and I want you to play and share your story. And I just was like wide eyed, you know, I'd never seen a revival in a place like that. I'd always wanted my whole life to go. So on the way to the first service, which is in someone's backyard, he gets a call from somebody on his phone and we're on a rickshaw, which is a little bike, taxi bike, you know, in the village. And so we're sitting in the back of this, in this basket in the back of a guy that's pedaling us on a bike, which, and he gets a call and it's somebody screaming on the phone, screaming on the phone. I can hear it through him. And I'm like, what is happening? That's crazy. And he's like, all right, we have, and he turned to me, he said, okay, we have a little detour on the way to church. It's just going to take a minute. Don't worry about it. It's like, all right. So we go to this house. I walk into this house and there is a five foot one woman with the reddest eyes I've ever seen screaming like a man, throwing dishes everywhere, fully demonically possessed. Like I'd never seen anything like that. It was like a horror movie. Like I, I didn't know that this could happen to people. I've never seen this level of demonic. And, and I walked right into the house and you could tell the guy was, knew that I was shocked. And he looked at me and he's like, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. No problem, five minutes, five minutes, you know. And so this, this lady's in there and she's chucking plates and she's like getting knives out and it's crazy. And he's just all, this pastor I'm with, he's a G, you know. He's just cool and collected. He's like, five minutes, don't worry. He's like, and he takes me and he puts me into the corner of the room, over here in the corner of the room. And he's like, just sit there for a minute. It's five minutes, you know. He walks over. He starts having a conversation with the demon inside of the lady. And this was later translated back to me. And he's telling the demon, why are you in this woman? You're one of the easiest demons to come out. <laughs> Just come out. And, he, and the demon goes, I'm not gonna come out. I've been inside of her for 15 years and it all leads to this moment today. And so the pastor is talking to the demon inside of the lady and he says, what do you mean meaning this to this moment? He said, I've built an altar in her, and I built an altar behind the house and I'm sacrificing her three children today. And the pastor looks at the demon and starts laughing and he goes, you ain't gonna do nothing. You're gonna come out is what you're gonna do. The demon starts screeching, I'm not gonna come out, I'm not gonna come out. The pastor looks over at me and I'm sitting there, guys, you can imagine. I am like, this is crazy. The pastor looks at me, he smiles at the lady as she's screaming, he looks at me and he points. He reaches into his little leather, dusty, backpack that he has and he pulls out a tambourine <laughs> now now listen this ain't no normal tambourine this ain't this ain't like your church mama's tambourine 
This is a tambourine that has two thirds of the rings missing. This is a bloody sword. It has grooves in it from where his hands hold the wood. He takes out his tambourine and he just starts walking around the house, shaking his tambourine, singing his worship song that he wrote in his indigenous language, singing about the power of breakthrough in Jesus. Now here's the thing. He's not even looking at the woman. He like goes into another dimension. The woman's screaming, doing crazy. He just picks up his tambourine and he's smiling. He's walking around the house, singing about Jesus, shaking his tambourine. He's just smiling. He's just smiling. And after about five minutes, I'm watching what he's not watching. This woman starts going through deliverance. You can just see these demons coming out of her one by one by one. And he's just sitting there. He is in another zone with the Lord, singing and worshiping. And then after about five to 10 minutes of this deliverance that's taking place as he's walking around the house, he noticed that it gets really quiet and the woman's laying flat on the ground. And he turns over and he looks at me and he looks at her and he goes like that. (laughs) He walks over to the woman, puts his hand on her and he begins to speak to her. And you can totally tell she's come back to her feminine self. She's speaking in a normal voice. She's crying. She's weeping. And all of a sudden, the husband comes into the room. The husband brings the three kids into the room. We get the family together. He starts praying over the family. He takes his tambourine out. They all start worshiping. This is about a 15-minute ordeal. And then he looks at me and he goes, all right, let's go to church. Let's go. As if he does this every single day of the week. As we're walking out of the door, and by the way, we did see the altar that was built in the back. That, she, that this demon was gonna sacrifice her kids. I mean, it was crazy. As we're walking out of the door, I'm just sitting here going, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. I don't even know how to explain this. I don't know what's going on. My theology is being rocked. This is wild. And as we walk out of the door, he turns and he looks at me and he goes, Brother Sean, he's like, worship brings the breakthrough. When we worship, the demons flee. This was my theology 101 on the power of breakthrough in worship. And I learned it from an Indian pastor when I was 16 years old. How many believe that worship brings a breakthrough? In Judges chapter six, I want you to turn there. We have the story of Gideon. And one of the reasons I love the story of Gideon is because Gideon was the least of the least of the least of the least. God never chooses who he thinks, who we think he's gonna choose. He loves the random people. He loves the the people that are outcasts. He loves those that really have no shot. And it's interesting that an angel of the Lord, and I'm gonna kind of breeze through some of this, but an angel of the Lord shows up as Gideon is hiding in the dark. And speaks over him, declaring over him, this is Judges 6, verse 11, an angel came of the Lord and sat down under the oak in Ophrah and belonged to Joash the Abyssalite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So an angel appears As Gideon's hiding in the dark, reminding him of his destiny. Hey, by the way, I know you're hiding in the dark right now. You're actually a mighty warrior. This is your time. And of course, Gideon goes through this insecure, insecurity complex. Well, if the Lord's with us, why has this happened to us? What about his wonders, his ancestors told us? What about the prophetic words? And and it's interesting, the angel doesn't even respond to his cynicism. He just says, go in your might and save save the camp. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midianite's hand. Am I not sending you? In other words, I ain't even gonna listen to you whining. Shut up and go forth. You have everything you need. And this is what I love about this. The angel of the Lord isn't giving Gideon this long therapy lesson. 
Like Gideon, it's time to read his self-help book. Feel powerful. Come on, Gideon, you need to live your best life. You need to feel your best you. You need to, you know, go to a shrink man and listen. And I, I'm not saying that stuff is bad, but I'm just saying in this context, the Lord just says, I'm not even gonna entertain your whining and your insecurities. Just go do it. We don't got time to mess with all this inward stuff. And this is the thing about worshipers these days. I know because I'm from that movement. There's so much inward turmoil. Even in songwriting, man, it's like people are like, I just want to find the inner part of myself. I don't want to be authentic. I want to go deep. I'm like, ain't nothing good in here. Stop singing in here. Go up here. That's where the breakthrough is. All this, all this, like working this out. I'm trying to work it. No, 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 no. Go up here. The breakthrough comes in the place of high praise. The breakthrough comes in the place where heaven is opened and God begins to move. It doesn't come from us trying to figure ourselves out more. So Gideon, so the angel of the Lord says, go in your might, save Gideon. And then Gideon says, pardon me, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest. And in Manasseh, I'm the least of my family. Again, more whining. The Lord answered, I will be with you and I will strike down the Midianites. Just go. Then Gideon goes back and it, Mind you, he's having a conversation with an angel. <laughs> like, he's talking to an angelic being. And he's actually like so overcome with his own insecurity that he has to work through his issues. And so he says to the angel, hey, by the way, um, if I found favor and give me a sign, don't go away until I come back. It's like telling the angel, hey, by the way, like, I know this is cool and you're giving me this mandate and everything, but can you just chill here for a minute? If it's really you, can you just kind of hold, hold for a minute? And he says, I will wait until you return, the Lord said. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, blah, 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 blah. Then Gideon still battles through insecurities. He says, but the Lord told him, don't be afraid. You are, you are not gonna die. So Gideon built an altar. The same night, the Lord told him, take a bull, do a sacrifice. Verse 27, this is key. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. Gideon was worried about cancel culture. He wanted to follow and be obedient to the Lord, but he didn't want everyone to see that he was. The interesting thing over the last two years, you would not believe, you know, as we went this journey across America, how many people were privately kind of like cheering us on, but they didn't want to appear that way publicly. We can't let everybody know. We can't be those crazy people like you. I mean, you go out there and worship in a pandemic and gather people and baptize people and get people saved and healed and all that stuff, and you endure the heat of being called, you know, a you know, a bigot and a racist and a homophobe and a white nationalist. I mean, we, every, every title you can think of, we've been called, right? You can endure that and we'll just like, yeah, man, you're awesome, little DMs. Yeah, you're great, I love it, like, like. But we don't wanna endure the fact that this is a culture that's hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I just wanna say something to y'all, especially in the wake of these two issues, the Disney thing and Roe v. Wade, you can't ride the fence no more. You can't ride the fence no more. There was an active, hostile, demonic spirit that is going to hate the fact that you're standing for life. In America, we gotta get used to the reality that we are going to be persecuted. The world is not going to like us. People are so infatuated and addicted in the church with having the world like them. Why? 
I mean, Jesus said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Jesus said, in this world, you're gonna have trouble. Every single disciple died an ugly death except for one. And yet we think we can cruise through life and be obedient to God and not have anybody troll us online. (laughs) Are you kidding me? If that's the least that we can endure for the kingdom? Like guys, we gotta rise up. We gotta get our spine back, man. We're talking about the church of Jesus Christ that's been around for 2000 years. We're talking about the salvation of millions of babies that have been aborted since 1973. And we can't endure a little flack. (laughs) Are y'all with me? Anyway, the Lord has mercy on Gideon, even though he's afraid of being canceled, he stays with him. And then then Gideon, you know, goes, well, make the fleece wet, make it dry, do this, do that. Okay, okay, anything else, Gideon, you want me to do? (laughs) I sent you an angel. (laughs) I let you do, I let you carry out your obedience in the night, which you really shouldn't have. And I made the fleece wet and I made it dry and I did all this stuff. And so here we go in verse chapter seven, Gideon arrives to the battlefield just as a man was telling his dream. I had a dream, he said, a round loaf of barley bread came tumbling down the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned. His friend responded, verse 14, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon. So God causes a dream to be shared right as Gideon shows up to the battle lines. Why? Because God knew that he probably needed that dream. He knew that he would probably not follow through unless he had a little more encouragement. So the Holy Spirit was like, share that dream with him right as he walks up. Okay. So Gideon hears this dream He goes back and he says this. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. He returned to the camp of Israel and he said, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the three men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Can you imagine showing up for battle? Being like, all right, bro, where's my sword? Where's my AK? Where's my weapons? Oh, oh, a jar? (laughs) You're giving me a jar? Oh, cool. You're giving me a jar and a trumpet. And we're facing a real army. And you know, Gideon has to try to explain to them theologically how the sound is mightier than the sword. When we show up in Orlando... We're not just a bunch of angry, mean people. We're showing up as worshipers to dethrone the principality and power of perversion. When we show up at the Supreme Court, people, honestly, we've been doing this for two years. People don't get it. We have all of these like even, even kind of crazy conservative people that aren't really saved, they show up and they, they, want, they want us to get them angry. And we start out with a G chord. Smiling. We're on the Supreme Court smiling as we face this death decree, knowing because we know who's on the throne. And so we do 30 minutes of just what y'all did this morning. And it's funny because even all the conservative folks, because there is no other big rally outside of this one, right? So we have members of Congress there. We have senators, congressmen. They all show up. They have to endure 30 minutes of swirly worship before we get to the other parts. They have to stand there. And it's funny because you can tell which ones are charismatic and which ones aren't. (laughs) Most of them in Congress aren't. (laughs) But they know that we're fighters, but we we start everything with worship. And we end everything with worship. Because it's all about the powers and principality. The sound is mightier than the sword. The sound is mightier than legislation. The sound is mightier than a mean tweet. The sound is where the breakthrough is. And so Gideon's telling them, he's telling them here, he's like, listen, just follow me. We're going down. The Lord keeps telling me, you have too many people. Make them drink out of the brook. Make them stand. So he gets down to 300. 
He's facing an army that you can't see the end of it with your eyes. And I love it how God puts us in position to where if breakthrough comes, no one else can get the credit. If you'll notice in your life, I don't believe God causes sickness or he causes pain or he causes, but sometimes the Lord will lead us, will be with us as we encounter places of difficulty to where it gets so hard and so dark, we don't know how we're gonna get out because he, he knows that when breakthrough comes, he's gonna get the glory. We can't claim it all. And so in this story, Gideon is, is, is bringing them before uh, 300 men with him. They reach the end of the camp. This is verse 19. At the beginning of the middle of the watch, just as they had changed the guard, they blew the trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hand and holding in their right hands with the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, key word there is held their position. They didn't move. They were confident in the breakthrough as they began to worship. All the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with swords. The army fled to Beth Shittah toward Zerex as far as the border. Gideon sent out messengers throughout the hill country in Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. So you have this moment where 300 of them and the scaredest, weakest, most insecure leader, probably in Israel's history up to this point, is led to bring jars and rocks and trumpets. And they bring such a spirit of breakthrough through the sound of the smashing and the release of the trumpets that chaos and confusion descends on the camp of the enemy and they kill each other. I'll never forget when I was 16 years old, 17 years old, and I was on the mall in Washington, D.C. And we were with almost half a million people and I remember praying. I remember being on the mall and I remember all of the sudden it came on so strong. It was like this spirit of intercession to see the reversing of the death decree. And I had visions in my mind and in this is really personal to me because, you know, my, my sister was adopted and, and, and my parents rescued her out of a really horrible situation. And, and so many of my friends are similar. And there was, there's an entire generation. Some of them were saved, but so many of them are missing. And, 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 and 65 million babies have been aborted on the altar of convenience since 1973, only China and North Korea are in the same category as us when it comes to abortion rules. That's good, some good company, huh? China and North Korea are the only other countries in a similar category as America, and yet we're sitting here, and, and, and I remember praying, and I remember, remember, remember saying, God, could this be possible in my generation? And then in the years leading up, it just got worse. In the Obama years, the worst judges were appointed and it looked like things were going the opposite way. And I was just like, God, we have this promise that you're gonna do this in our lifetime. And I remember riding one day in the car with Bill Johnson, who's my pastor. I remember riding with him and it was just, I was just bummed out. You know, I had the life band on, had the life tape. I've been praying, I've been doing sieges. I've been believing for this breakthrough in a generation. And, and I just gave up. I cut the life band off in disgust one day. I was like, these prayers are worthless. These sieges, these gatherings, these things, nothing's happening, it's going the opposite way. And I remember riding with Bill and I was like, I don't think this is ever gonna happen in our lifetime. America has a death decree hanging over it. Judgment of God hanging over it. If you don't think America has a judgment hanging over it because of what happened, you need to wake up. 
This nation is being judged because of that. You can look after 73, prayer was taken out of schools. You can see the secularization of society. You can see the indoctrination of our kids. You can see what happened in education. Everything went downhill from that moment. I remember driving with Bill in the car one day and I was, we're coming back from a basketball game and I said, hey, I don't know what to do, man. I just, I'm tired of praying these prayers. I don't think they're gonna change it. He looked at me and he goes, oh, it's gonna happen in our lifetime. It's gonna happen. We got the word of the Lord. We gotta worship until the breakthrough happens. Worship until the breakthrough happens. And here we are. On the precipice. On the precipice. And listen, we need a whole lot. We need an adoption movement. We need, there's a lot of stuff we need to see happen in America. But the fact that we're on the very edge of history is mind-boggling, guys. Intercessors have been praying. We're gonna be gathering. Apparently, there's a decision that's coming down on Monday, a big decision from the Supreme Court. This could be the one. And we could be there a day later. Why do I wanna bring that issue up? Because we've been praying and believing for it for 50 years. A little more worship to push it into the end zone. A little more prayer. I am so shocked that, <laughs> that this issue would even be controversial. It's crazy. It shows how far we've fallen from our foundations. Had a vision one time of when I was praying over this issue, had a vision of millions of children in heaven that never got a chance to live. standing up cheering us on <laughs> as there's as there's 20 of us 20 of us outside of the courtroom in Dallas where abortion happened as there's 30 of us it seems so pitiful and insignificant and there they were in heaven millions of them millions of them cheering us on This is our moment, church. This is our moment in America. Worship is our weapon. We can't stop. We can't fall back to just church as normal. We gotta keep singing. We gotta keep praising. We gotta keep prophesying. We gotta keep declaring this is the hour we were born for. The Lord told me before I left to go on this trip to um, try to find these stones that I got. I, uh, I, I didn't even know where, I knew that I got them years ago, but I couldn't find them. And I just opened the right box in storage. And uh, these are stones that I picked up from the Valley of Allah in Israel. And... Um, this is the very same brook where David picked up his stones to slay Goliath. So five years ago, I, I got these stones and, 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 and the, Lord, the Lord spoke to me so clearly. He said, Sean, I haven't called you to try to win Dove Awards and worship hits and YouTube likes. Not that any of that stuff is bad, but I've called you to slay giants. Worship that slays giants. And so I, I went and I picked up these stones and they've been sitting in that box ever since I got back to Israel. And this is the first time I've traveled with them. And I feel like it's prophetic for what's about to happen in the next few days. Why don't you stand with me? And I just, I want to pray. I feel like tonight and today God's giving us stones 
He's reminding us who we are. You know, Paul and Silas, they weren't worship leaders. They didn't sing in perfect pitch. But did you know they set a whole prison free through their worship? You don't gotta be some professional worship leader. You gotta be the singing crazy person driving down the highway in your car. You gotta be the worshiping mama in the grocery store. Yeah, I know inflation and food prices, I just keep singing, man. Just keep worshiping. You gotta be the person that goes to pick your kids up from school and you just anoint that school with the sound of praise every time you go and get them. It's like, no, we're not gonna stand for our kids being assaulted and sexualized. No, we ain't gonna stand for that. We're gonna worship that demon's coming down. We are a praying and a worshiping people. It's not part of our rhetoric. It's not part of our Sunday morning activities. It's who we are. It's what we're gonna do for eternity. And it's not just worship that sounds nice and feels good. It's worship that slays every giant in the land. So I just want you to lift your hand up and I just wanna pray over you. And then we're gonna come back tonight and we're gonna party. It's gonna be so fun. We're gonna live stream this all over America. We're gonna capture it. Maybe even a recording. I don't know what God's gonna do. We don't know, but he's given us keys tonight to unlock doors that no man can shut and shut doors that no man can open. He's given us stones to slay the giant. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for these worshipers. I thank you for this beautiful community, Lord, that stood so strong during the, the, the raging seas of 2020, God, that they stood strong, that they pressed in. I pray, God, today that you would baptize us like never before in a spirit of worship and breakthrough. God, I pray today, God, that, that, that you will open the mouths of everybody in this room, that they would understand that worship is their weapon. I pray every time that they get frustrated or every time that they don't know what to do or they feel surrounded by the enemy, Lord, that they would begin to lift their voice, God, that they would begin to lift their voice up in praise. Lord, that they would know that there's power and authority in their sound. And the enemy tried to silence us in the last few years, but it's all coming back on them now a spirit of breakthrough. And we just declare over Charleston, we declare over this state, this is gonna be a breakthrough season. Every giant in the land is coming down. And we thank you, Lord, that this house is gonna write songs and release melodies and rhythms. They're gonna release high praise, God, over this region.